Can you see this uh, cover slide? Did. Yeah, okay, Yeah. super. So yep, my name is Angie Gupta. I'm an extension educator and I do tons of stuff with invasive species and for the last couple of years have been doing work on jumping worms. And um, I'm gonna start out with a primer on invasive species and then I promise I will get to jumping worms. So uh, let's see, okay, there we go. So today's presentation, I'm gonna cover introduction to invasive species, a little overview of laws and regulations because interestingly worms like bump up to a bunch of them, um, how to report using some online apps or some smartphone apps and, and great online tools, and then the details of jumping worms. So identification and impact, next steps and how to help and policy and research update. So quickly, a definition about invasive species. So these are any species that are introduced that are non-native, uh, usually by human activity that cause ecologic, economic, or human health harm, right? So those are important characteristics. They have to cause harm, ecologic, economic, or human health. And there's just a lot more movement in today's world. Uh, COVID has this kind of on lockdown, but goods and services move great distances very efficiently. And so tons of things can survive today that could never previously survive. And so this is part of how invasive species get around. So again, to sort of bring this home a little bit, so there are lots of things that are not native, um, some of which we take a lot of pride in in Minnesota. So apples um, and, and honeybees being good examples. Uh, so these are non-native, but they're not problematic and we take pride and we invest in them. Then there are those species species that are non-native that are invasive that cause harm. And so buckthorn and emerald ash borer are two good examples of those. And then there are lots of things that are native, even if we don't like them. And so they're never invasive because they're native. So examples would be poison ivy and bronze birch borer. So lots of people don't like these things. We might manage against them, but they're by definition not invasive. All right, uh, okay. Um, and so then a little bit about stages of invasion, because I think it can matter as we think about management and what steps to do next. So the first stage and the really, in some ways, the easiest is to manage those species that are either new or not present. And so hopefully for most of you, jumping worms falls into this category. Hopefully you don't have them. And so the management you're looking at is prevention. Um, a, another example of that would be tree of heaven. It's a species that we don't think we have and we don't want in Minnesota. but not widely distributed. At a state level, this is where jumping worm is. So we do have jumping worms in the state. You'll see a map later of the counties in which it's been found, um, but it isn't widely distributed. Not everyone has it and you can still do a lot of prevention. Uh, another example of that would be oriental bittersweet. And then finally, you have things, invasive species that are established and widely distributed. So the cat is essentially out of the bag um, and buckthorn is our best example. You can find it more or less anywhere. And so management, you have a lot fewer management choices as you become down that pyramid. All right, this is my only chart, so please bear with me, but this is a basic population chart. And with all invasive species, including jumping worms, um, you know, when a pest is first new in the environment, there tend to be very little of it because it's new. It takes a little while for the population densities to one, establish, and two, grow, and three, become problematic. And so, you know, this is point of introduction. And then if you go up here to economic threshold, this is when it starts to cause uh, damage. You get to this injury. This is when you're actually, its costs are, are going up and profit is going down. And my experience is that most people, it like doesn't hit the news until it's above economic injury. And so if you think of this also as a management scale, you have a lot fewer options for management when it's already a big problem, right? So you have the most options down here when it's very first getting established. The problem is lots of people don't know what it is. They, we don't necessarily know if it's a problem. And so it's hard to do early detection and rapid response. So I think that this is about jumping worms, where jumping worms are on that graph when it comes to the Twin Cities and maybe Rochester. Um, and as you get outside of those spaces, jumping worm goes to the bottom left. Um, so further lower down that curve. Uh, and so that, again, I think that manages from, from a management perspective, it matters from a management perspective. Okay, so just a quick sideline into uh, to climate. And so this is, these are charts. There's two slides of these from the Minnesota uh, Public Radio did a series back in 2015. And the point here is as Minnesota gets warmer and wetter, so in this chart, wetter, um, more things can survive here. And so this data is showing you that in, two, in, in 1891, you can see um, the warmest corner was Southeast Minnesota, the driest was Northwest. And then um, that is still the same case, 
but as you can see here in 2010, so fully 11 years ago now, um, much more of the state it is wetter. Uh, and there's, there's no part of the state that is in, as dry as it was in 1891 um, in that northwest corner. So just more things can survive. So typically the limiting factors for lots of plants, insects, animals are water and temperature. So there's your water chart. Um, and this is your temperature. So this is again from that same Minnesota Public Radio article. Um, and this again is pretty old. I mean, this is now 15 years old, the data on the right, but this is plant hardiness zone map. So in 1990, you can see the Northern half of Minnesota was zone five and the Southern half was zone four. And now the Northern third is zone three, the Southern third is zone four and about the North, I mean, sorry, the middle third is zone four and the, the Southern third is zone five. That's a lot warmer. So things can just survive here that couldn't have survived previously. And again, thinking of all invasive species, the best example of that is emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer has never been found in zone three anywhere in the world. And so when the northern half of Minnesota was considered zone three, we could say with relative certainty that emerald ash borer wouldn't be a problem on our ash trees in, in zone three. Um, as zone three slips north and we become essentially more exposed to insects and invasive species generally, like emerald ash borer. So again, point here is um, lots of things can survive now they didn't used to be able to and that has sort of rippling consequences. All right, this is big and ugly, so bear with me, but these are like all of the ways in which we can we can regulate invasive species in the state of Minnesota. And the reason I bring this up is because jumping worms, frankly, aren't regulated, but there's been a lot of chatter about regulating them, but where would you do that and how? And so, they are technically regulated, as all species are technically, in this unlisted non-native species category at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So these species have no restrictions on sale, purchase, possession, but they may not be introduced into a free living state within, within Minnesota I mean, without Minnesota Department of Natural Resources approval and thorough evaluation. So in theory, like with the vast majority of things, um, you cannot let a boa constrictor loose in the state of Minnesota or a crocodile or anything else without going through the DNR. Um, I use these pet examples because people do this, right? Um, and so then there isn't a lot of regulation to manage that. And so that's where jumping worms fall into the category. Um, importantly, they are not illegal to sell or purchase or to possess. And that is gonna come up a little bit later. Um, but this, this isn't limiting. And so when we get to the importance of the problem of jumping worm, this might not sound like a good deal, this lack of, lack of regulation. So I'm gonna dive a little bit um, through regulation because again, jumping worms kind of bump around. Um, and so that's how we might regulate any number of different things. In Minnesota, we have the noxious weed law. So that regulates invasive plants or, or um, plants, lots of which are invasive. And if you can see on the right, this the left, this scale, more management and less management. So we have an eradicate list. And so those are species that it is illegal to have on your property. So you have to kill them or remove them. So, so an example of that would be oriental bittersweet. Then we have the control list. So the idea with species on this list is that you can have them on your property. You have to keep them from spreading, right? So that's the big caveat. And so, uh, so barberries fall into this category. And then um, we have the restricted noxious weed. So this is, there's a lot more of these buckthorn falls into this category. Uh, you're not allowed to knowingly sell them, move them or propagate them, but you don't actually have to manage them. They've kind of escaped and they're kind of everywhere. And then we have the specially regulated list. And this, this category kind of changes a lot, um, but it includes things like amber maple. So this is common that species that have been in horticulture might start out on the specially regulated and then move their way up the list as those species become um, phased out within the horticultural sales. And that's essentially what you're seeing with amber uh, maple. So this is one way in which you can regulate. That's all under state statute. Uh, also know that there is a federal noxious weed law. So of course we abide by that. And then this, the counties also have noxious weed lists. And so this is one way in which you could think about regulating a species. Another way is the quarantines. And so we've become very familiar with quarantines as people because of COVID, but it turns out they've been around as a tool for a really long time. And there are four uh, forest 
quarantines on in the state of Minnesota right now. There's the emerald ash borer quarantine. There's the gypsy moth quarantine. That was in canker's disease. This is a complex of a disease and an insect. And then mountain pine beetle, which is an insect. And so this is a, a, you know, a different way to manage a problem. Um, and of course, the point here is to reduce or eliminate the spread of a pest through human assisted movement. So if you don't have it, we don't want you to get it. So we're going to keep things out or to restrict the pest from moving while also facilitating trade. So if we know it is somewhere, can we limit its movement um, and still allow trade? And again, when I gave this presentation 18 months ago, a lot of people had a hard time thinking about quarantines and now we've all lived through them with COVID. So I feel like we kind of get the, the play here. You're trying to protect um, resources by still having some level of freedom and where is that happy space? And it was decided that worms, well, we, it hasn't been decided, but it is unlikely that worms will be regulated through a quarantine. So, so I'm not a pause about policy and I, I make an assumption that we're taking questions at the end. So I will plow through and if, if there's a burning question or someone wants to interrupt me, do that. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about reporting. And so this is how we would report all invasive species in the state of Minnesota. And I mean everything. So whether it's emerald ash borer, jumping worms, um, poison hemlock, or zebra mussels, the whole gamut are reported this way in Minnesota. And the best way to do that is through a smartphone app called the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. It's free on an Android or on an Apple device. Uh, and that is by far the best, most user-friendly option. And if you're interested, feel free to do that while I talk. Uh, there is a way to do that same level of reporting online. It is not as user-friendly. And then if you're absolutely in a pinch or you're very technology resistant, you can do it through an email or a phone number, but that is not our preferred method. So I'll talk about each of these here. So this is my first video. I am pretty optimistic it will play. So I'm gonna hit play and it would be helpful if folks nodded if you can hear. Okay, I can't hear so that doesn't bode well. But the good news is this one does not have any words. Oh, choose, she's sorry. I was trying to get the audio up and I lost it all together. We can hear it. I, I can anyways. You can. Okay, great. So maybe it's just my side, which is weird. No, I can't hear it. Okay. There's no word. So I'm going to let it go and try to sort it out. awkward. Um, the way this works is when I, I don't know that you can see it, but every time I try to go to that uh, audio sound feature, the zoom menu pops up on top of it. So it was really awkward. Can someone tell me, I'm going to look at more of you and just sort of, um, if you could raise your hand, if you had audio, that would be helpful. So if you could hear it. Okay, so most people, so maybe it's just my device, which is weird. Okay, um, we'll see how the next one goes. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, many of them have words, so this, this could be a real problem. So the idea here is that by reporting these things, um, it goes to a professional and we're all connected. So this is the best way in which to report uh, jumping worms and many other things. 
All right, here we go. Um, again, you can do the same type of reporting at this website, um, and it's all the same information. So I'm not gonna actually do it, but there's a report citing. You can also go to training. There's tons of great training tools on there. Um, and the, the reason this isn't as good is because most people at this point, I think are taking pictures with their phones. And so it just is a different layer to have to upload the picture to your computer and then upload it to this website. In addition, if you are taking the pictures with your phone and you have your location on there, um, in the app, it will auto pull your GPS. And so you don't have to think about that. If you do it on the website, then you have to then, you know, navigate within essentially a Google map and then pin where your point is. And so it's just a little bit more cumbersome, but it, it works. Um, and so, you know, they all actually go to the same platform. So they're all talking. It's not like they're different. Uh, they just have different interfaces. All right. I am going, this one has words. So we want this one to hear. So if you, I'm going to make you guys a little bigger so I can see you. Um, if you guys do not have audio this time, if you could raise your hands, that would be very helpful. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit what did you see. If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation detail screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. Okay, so I think I was so concerned about the audio, which I did not have, um, that I forgot to really introduce this video, and so I'll do that in reverse. So this was about iNaturalist, which is a different platform, and this is not for invasive species. This is for all things that have ever been alive. And so the reason I include iNaturalist in this presentation is because I think it's a super excellent tool to just understand what is out there. Right, and so um, if you if you're not very familiar with worms, for example, and you may be worried about being embarrassed that you're reporting a jumping worm when really it's maybe just a night crawler, then you can use this iNaturalist, and it will help you understand the difference. It will give you options, and you can say, "Oh, I really think it is a jumping worm," and then report it to EdMaps. Um, similarly, I have found it really helpful to just better understand what's in my yard or what's in my neighborhood or what's in my environment. And so it turns out there are many things that I don't know. Um, and so this just helps me to understand what is out there. And then for every description, when you're looking at them and you're choosing what might be the thing that you're looking at, there's a little description about what that is. And it will say whether it's native or to where it is native. And so I find it to just be a very helpful tool to just get to know your environment. And then if it is a problematic species, then we would ask that you report that to EdMaps. Um, all right. So um, and this is, a, again, a very short video. There are no words. Um, and this is just about how to take good images because with jumping worms and many invasive species, it turns out bad pictures do not help us with identification. And so it's really helpful to know what we're looking at or looking for so you can take a good picture of it. So this is about, I think this is a minute, it's pretty short. And it's just about how to take a good picture.
And so for jumping worms in particular, um, it can be hard to, they, they wiggle. We're going to see a video of that in a bit, uh, in a few minutes, but it can be hard to get a good quality image. And there are some key attributes that we need to see in those pictures to make a positive identification. So these, you know, you might have to take a few and then delete the bad ones, but it, it is really important. And all of these apps, you can upload multiple pictures. And I always recommend multiple pictures because we're often looking at a variety of characteristics to make a positive identification. And so we're putting all of those images together to make that dif differentiation. All right, I finally am getting to worms now. You guys were beginning to wonder, I suspect. Um, so this is a triangle, this is a, a pyramid that is really about worms, period. Um, and so if you're not familiar or you don't know, so there are no native earthworms in the state of Minnesota. All of our earthworms are non-native and many of them, well, they're all problematic in our forested ecosystem. So a lot of the research that's been done has been done in forests. And so jumping worms are the first a worm that's really been problematic in gardens. So I'm going to kind of work our way to gardens. Uh, so the reason that worms are such a problem is they are major ecosystem engineers. They significantly change the soil. And when they do that, they, of course, change the plants that grow in the soil and then the herbivores that feed on the plants and then the first level carnivores that feed on the herbivores. And then you have these top tier primary predators that feed on everything below that. And so as they change the soil, um, those worms significantly change everything kind of downstream from there. And so um, this is one iteration of this. We're just going to watch a, a less than three minutes of this video, but I think it's a nice demonstration of kind of why this is so complicated. And again, it's not just about worms, but worms bookend um, this segment. So we're going to start at three minutes, 26 seconds. And raise your hand if you do not hear it. I think you guys are hearing it. It must be a way my computer Thank you, Bob. Let's take a look at who else finds a home on buckthorn. Oat crown rust is a fungi, a pathogen that thrives in oats and barley, reducing crop yields by as much as 40%. When it's not on oats or barley, this pathogen lives on buckthorn, causing small brown leaf spots that aren't problematic to buckthorn. Buckthorn grows abundantly in the upper Midwest. It's everywhere. How did this tree that offers safe harbor for the soybean aphid and oak crown rust become so prominent? It had a little help from other species new to North America. These other new species came with the first European settlers way back in the 1600s on plants and in the soil. In the soil from Europe, there were earthworms. Earthworms are not native to most of Minnesota. They are not good for native forest as they gobble up the leaves on the forest floor, disrupting an ecosystem that coexists with the native plants, disrupting things like microbes, fungi, insects, plants, and wildlife. The European earthworm and its predator, the Asian flatworm, digest the plant matter and turn it into soil. This warm digested soil is inviting for new species of plants to move in. Buckthorn seeds like bare mineral soil, compounding the problem. People first brought buckthorn to North America in the mid-1800s and sold it as an ornamental landscaping plant. Buckthorn was planted in yards, in towns, and on farms. People planted it because it made a great hedgerow. If we only knew then what we know now. But there's one more non-native player in this story. In honor of the birds from Shakespeare's writing, a group of Shakespeare fans brought over European starlings from across the Atlantic, had a ceremony, and let them loose in Central Park. That was 1890. These birds took to their new landscape and, along with other species, helped spread buckthorn seeds. Seeds of buckthorn may look inviting to wildlife, but are not nutritious. The birds drop seeds on the soil that was made friendly for invasives by the advanced team of earthworms living and multiplying below our feet. Buckthorn gained a foothold, invading the landscape and the soybean aphid moved in. Okay, so hopefully that again just kind of gives you an idea of how what seem like relatively inconspicuous uh, animals can have these pretty pretty intense ecosystem impacts and then we're going to 
really get to how this works in your garden. So again, sort of to really bring that home, if you remember the definition of invasive species, it included ecosystem, economic, uh, e ecosystem, economic, or human health issues. And you can see how even just our basic Eurasian suite of Eurasian earthworms do those things, right? So they change the soil, which changes the ragweed density, increases allergies, increases tick population, which of course um, has implication for Lyme disease. When you include buckthorn and aphids, you get la Asian lady beetle. That's another invasive plant used as a biocontrol. Um, for aphids, uh, you get changes in soil nutrients, which change crop production, um, fire and dry Drought regimes also change, which impacts forest productivity and forest biodiversity. So it turns out they're very impactful, um, but often overlooked. And so um, when this is one more way to say that, so these are common impacts of just generally earthworms. So loss of native plants, um, hard to regenerate native trees, habitat loss for ground nesting birds, insects, amphibians, reptiles, and small mammals. Um, but now jumping worms, like what the heck? So we're gonna talk, so now hopefully you know a little bit more about worms generally, and now we're gonna kind of compare and contrast to jumping worms. So this is the current known distribution by county of jumping worms. And I use county and not point, I often use points, uh, but jumping worms are, are um, uh, people don't necessarily want to admit they have jumping worms. So they allow us to put their addresses into the database, but only allow us to show it at the county level. Um, where a less controversial species, we can also, sh we can often show it to the exact pinpoint. So you can see my yard, for example. Uh, and lots of folks aren't very comfortable with that. So, so um, these green dots don't mean that the entire county is infested. It means that there has been at least one report within that county. And that is a very important difference. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's in your neighborhood, but if it's in the, if you're in any of these counties, you should be wary. All right. And so this is all from EdMaps, um, which is, I can click in there later if anyone's interested, but that is that same reporting tool that I'm recommending that you use. All right, so this is what jumping worm impacts look like. So most gardeners, when they first realize they have jumping worms are noticing the soil and the soil looks like coffee grounds and it feels like coffee grounds, right? It's no longer that nice soil texture that you're, comfort, that you're accustomed to. And it's pretty dramatic. It can be at large infestation levels, a pretty dramatic change. Um, it can kill plants completely kill plants, it can increase erosion and it can make it hard to grow plants. And the reason for this, so our normal suite of Eurasian worms grow with between zero and six feet of the soil horizon, right? So zero to six feet, so taller than me going straight down. Um, but jumping worms live entirely in the top six inches of soil horizon. So that place where you and I are gardening and we're growing things and we're manipulating the soil a lot. And a research out of University of Wisconsin, Madison Arboretum, on worm densities, they did it in a forested system. So um, they were using meter by meter square um, as their area. And what they discovered was a couple of interesting things. After jumping worms moved into a stand, all other worms disappeared. So a whole suite of Eurasian worms that were living from zero to six feet disappeared altogether. And they were left with only jumping worms and the jumping worms only in the top six inches of soil, but the absolute worm density, the number of worms per square meter was sometimes more than twice as many as when they lived in the whole six foot of soil horizon, right? So that is a lot of worms at the very tip top where we're really managing the soil. And that's where all of the all of the bad news happens. All right, so quickly, identification. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about essentially their growth, um, their, their annual growth. So they, if they were plants, we would consider them annuals. They're only adults during the summer um, and they do look a lot like night crawlers, your common night crawler worms um, that you would maybe see for fishing bait when they are mature. So when they get to full adult sizes, they're very similar in size to night crawlers. There are a couple of key differences. And if you were to take a picture and report them, these are the things we need you to notice. So one, the number of segments from the head to this, uh, this clitellum is usually between 11 and 13 on jumping worms. It tends to be much 
greater. So the number of segments between the head and the clitellum on night crawlers is much greater. So this little collar, the clitellum, is closer to the head on jumping worms. Um, another indicator is on jumping worms, this clitellum tends to be very light. And on night crawlers, it can be about the same color as the adjacent uh, skin. Another indicator is this clitellum on jumping worms is flat. It's the same level as the worm on either side. On night crawlers, it's considered like a saddle, like a horse's saddle, if you will. Um, and so it's, it's fatter on the top and the sides, and then it's flush to the ground on the other side. There are a couple other things that you can't really look at in an image, but if you were to hold a night crawler and a jumping worm side by side, the jumping worm isn't as flappy. It's like more substantial, kind of like a little tiny snake. Um, whereas a jumping worm or as a night crawler just kind of flaps over your finger, right? There's not, it's not very, it's not very sturdy. Um, but the biggest indicator uh, is this. So this, if you can hear it, fine, it's background noise. There's no, there are no words, but this is what the movement of jumping worm looks like. It's very indicative. They are very active when disturbed. Um, and if you notice, they squiggle like a snake. They kind of go back and forth, back and forth, and they are fast. And so, oh, that wasn't what I had expected. Let's go back, try this again. There we go. And so notice this, a couple flop out of that bowl. So they really do move much faster than jumping worms. They invade a site more quickly. Um, and this is typically the behavior that people are noticing. So these really active, abnormally active worms, they're kind of gross, they're startling when you first run into them. Um, and then that coffee ground like soil texture, it tends to be the tip off. And I, I don't think I said this, um, but the coffee ground soil texture is actually the, um, the essentially the worm poo. So it's the castings that come out and they're, you're left with this coffee ground texture. So let's talk a little bit about this life cycle. Again, it's essentially an annual life cycle. Um, and this is really important when you think about its distribution, how these worms get around. And so this time of year, um, they are in these cocoons. So there's an, uh, one or two eggs per cocoon. The cocoons are about the size of poppy seeds and about the same color. So if you imagine trying to spot those in your soil, it's virtually impossible. Uh, and that's how they're going to overwinter. So in the spring, when it gets warm, they will hatch. And it's not super early. It's probably uh, April or May. And they're going to hatch as little tiny baby worms. And they're indistinguishable from other baby worms. You cannot tell them apart. So we cannot do identification on worms in, until about the end of July or early August when they're mature. So come the end of July, early August, they will be adult size. And so this is the jumping worm. And so this is the clitellum. Um, and full disclosure, this is my house. And I have had jumping worms for a number of years. Um, so anyway, lots of experience with these. But this is what it looks like as an adult. We're not entirely positive how many, uh, how many life cycles an adult can complete um, during our growing season, but it is likely at least two to three. And I suspect it depends on how late our fall goes. Uh, and so what that means is this adult can become mature, um, sexually reproduce, and then produce eggs. Those eggs can then hatch and produce another round of adults, and that can happen at least two to three times. Um, we're not sure how many eggs are produced per worm, and we think the reason that they die is the worms physically freeze in the soil. So we think that they, they, the adult stage ends when the soil itself freezes, although we're not 100% sure. So they overwinter as those eggs. And what we know is that when all of us do our fall yard management and we rake up those leaves and we dispose of those leaves, if we have jumping worms, we can move the eggs. And so fall leaf management is a vector for jumping worms. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. All right, so now we're gonna kind of peel back a little bit and just think of how we move invasive species generally. And then we'll talk about the, how we move jumping worms specifically. 
So invasive species, there's lots of pathways that they can move. There's natural distribution and human distribution and jumping worms can do both. Um, so common forms of natural distribution are birds move things around, in this case, uh, oriental bittersweet seed, they poop it out and then it grows up a tree and now you have a new plant. Um, so there are uh, plenty of insects that can fly to varying degrees. There are caterpillars that blow in the wind and they can move around and distribute that way. Uh, then of course we have things like dandelion seeds, which easily blow and move around um, in, you know, in, during the growing season and then they, they germinate new dandelions. So there's not a lot that you and I can do about, do about these things, although knowing how they come in can be very helpful as we think about how to manage them. Now, I just want you to take maybe 10 seconds to think about ways in which we people might move any of these species around. Okay, so I hope that you had some of these types of ideas in your head. So it turns out that we can move lots of things around in soil. So this is often weed seeds, but it can absolutely be jumping worm cocoons. Uh, we move a lot of things around inadvertently on equipment. Same deal, weed seeds, jumping worm eggs, uh, seeds, eggs, definitely can move around. Kind of any way you can move weed seeds, you can move jumping worm eggs. Um, anytime that we walk and use paths, we can be moving invasive species. At any time we move materials into a site, we can move invasive species. And this is particularly um, important when you think about jumping worms. So we're going to get to that in a moment. So this is my house again. Um, and again, I've had jumping worms for a number of years now. And so here are some common ways we know jumping worms move around. So I have wood chips uh, around my edging and it turns out a very oddly, most worms cannot do this, but jumping worms can fully survive on cellulose, on wood fiber. And so that means that they can live in wood chips, both from my local wood chip pile and from big box store plastic bagged wood chips. So if I go to Walmart or Menards or Home Depot and I buy those bags of wood chips, they can have live jumping worms in them. And we've had many reports of that. Um, we can, they can also, jumping worms can move in soil and we, they can move in plant roots. So we think when they get really desperate, they'll actually eat the plant roots. And so you can move them in the plants themselves. And so when I buy plants from the farmer's market or plant sales, there is this potential vector source. Finally, um, so jumping worms, I think, are not intentionally included in most angler bait that people would fish with, but we know that lots of people, including those that sell worms, do not know actually how to identify worms, and we've had clear and confirmed cases of people having jumping worms in those angler bait worms, um, and we know that those um, jumping worms have been sold in a variety of worm products like online, so both vermiculture and angler worms, and I think they're just being misidentified, but it's a problem. And so these are some vectors that I think are pretty common, uh, but we're not done, right? So um, I have planted vegetables in my edging before and again, so now I have a plant and I have the soil in which that plant came. Um, this is a little backyard home composter. It by itself should not be problematic, but it turns out I have often supplemented my little backyard home composter, which I think never actually gets hot enough, probably because it doesn't get enough sun, um, with the local yard waste site compost or my community's compost. And I I actually suspect it is my community's compost that that is how I got jumping worms and so I'll talk about that in a moment but it turns out any of these types of things are vectors in addition to fall leaf management so I'm running a jumping worm report management project and I'll tell a little bit about that at the end um, and one of the things that that many people reported was that they got well several people that chose to, to close to disclose to me how they thought they got jumping worms several people got them from neighbors and a couple mentioned leaves in particular so lots of ways so this is where I want to kind of talk a little bit about these community um, community assets, often considered assets. So here in Rochester, we have a yard waste site. Um, I had for years thought of it as my compost site. So I would take my Christmas trees and my fall leaves to the, to the yard waste site. And in the spring, I would get very cheap compost. Well, it turns out in Rochester, it is a yard waste site. It is not a compost site. And that is important because the Minnesota Department, uh, no, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency regulates yard waste and compost and they regulate them differently. Most communities have yard waste sites, very few have compost sites, and the difference is in the temperatures. So 
proper composting temperature gets to 150 degrees. That kills most um, weed seeds and definitely kills worms. So worms and eggs die at between 120 and 130 degrees. So if you get your composting to 150, you are golden. Nothing is going to grow in that that's going to be problematic for you. Um, however, yard waste sites are not regulated as rigorously. There's no public record on what those sites get to, and they're simply not required to get to 150. So this is the sign that they put up outside of the Rochester yard to yard um, yard waste site. Uh, and so it's just sort of like buyer beware kind of situation. And so I think that is frankly pretty common. Um, and I suspect there are more jumping worms than have been reported. Okay. So I feel like I'm, I'm often doom and gloom and I don't want to leave you there. So um, if you have jumping worms, please do not panic. Um, take precautions to avoid spreading them because prevention is the only management that we have right now. There are no known treatments for jumping worms. So that is painful. Um, remove and destroy any jumping worms. You throw them directly into the trash. Well, put them in a plastic bag or a container that seals and then chuck them into the garbage that is proper disposal for jumping worms. Same with angler bait that's left over at the end of a fishing trip. Um, you know, gardeners, I, found, I find gardeners to be immensely creative people that are very passionate. And so please experiment. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the bounds of legal limitations here. Um, but, you know, experiment safely and then please tell us if you're, if you're seeing good results. So take a variety of plants and consider alternative landscaping, keep a log and share your successes with fellow gardeners. This is if you have jumping worms, right? So hopefully you don't and it won't matter and you're gonna prevent their introduction. But if you do, we wanna learn together. Um, and then please spread the word because honestly, when people call me sometimes in tears and I have no recommendations for management, no one is happy. <laughs> It does not make anybody happy. So the more we can get the word out and to prevent introductions, the better off we'll be. And follow the research. And I, I used to kind of consider this kind of a happen in area of research. And, 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 and then we maybe are accustomed to the COVID vaccine timeline. Okay, so no one cares about jumping worms the way we all care about a COVID vaccine. So no one is gonna solve this problem in a year, um, but there is some enthusiasm and the Minnesota Terrestrial Plant and Pest Center has funded some research and there's more research going on in Wisconsin. So there is research and we're, uh, we, would, we hope that there'll be some better answers in the future. I have to say worms have been very tricky to manage. So that's a thing. So share with folks, don't buy um, jumping worms. And again, worm ID is tricky and lots of people don't know how to do it. So be skeptical if you're buying worms. Um, don't move invasive species generally. Anglers dispose of any unwanted bait in the trash. That is the proper approach. Um, gardeners be on the lookout for jumping worms in soil, potted landscape plants, mulch and compost. That's a lengthy list. Vermiculture, if you're into worm composting, please identify your worms. Theoretically, you're never introducing worms out into your environment, but again, those warm eggs are really inconspicuous. So a couple of final closing thoughts. So um, please look for and identify worms. And if you think you have jumping worms, please report those worms. So again, first choice would be through those smartphone apps, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. Um, second choice would be through the website and then you can call Arrest the Pest if you want. Um, so I am running this project. I ran it last year and I will do it again for 2021. I can drop this link in if there's interest, but really all I'm asking gardeners to do and whatever landscape managers to do is to tell me if you have jumping worms, if you're managing them, how it's going for you. Is it working? Is it not working? What are you observing? And then we're sharing um, amongst ourselves and with the researchers and trying to figure out if there's an approach that looks like it's going to be promising. And then we can maybe do some like proper scientific research on it. Um, and so for more information, there's this Great Lakes Worm Watch. Uh, all of these things are Googleable terms. Um, and I will quickly jump into this. So this is what the Great Lake Worm Watch works, uh, looks like. It They have been working on this website, so it, it may not load straight away and it may look a little different, but I think the content will all be there. Um, but this is a sampling method that I find to be very useful, and it's called the liquid extraction method. It's relatively simple. So you can mix mustard powder, like the kind that you might buy at the co-op or the grocery store. Now, you kind of need a lot of it. So like I just bought five pounds online. Um, five pounds is a lot, like admittedly. Uh, but 
you know, probably more than you want to get at high V in the little tiny container. So I think it's about, um, I think it's a half, a quarter cup to a gallon of milk or a gallon of water rather. Um, and you mix it all up and then you pour it. And so this is intended for all worms. So think of those worms that are six feet down. So you pour that gallon over a square foot of surfal of soil surface area. And then if you wait for up to an hour, those deepest six foot worms, six foot down worms will have emerged. And what, what happens is the, the mustard power irritates their skin and kind of like on a super rainy day when they get drowned out of their burrows, they just come to the top to get relief. Um, now, so an hour is what we talk about if you have that suite of Eurasian earthworms that can be as deep as six feet. Jumping worms, I find they will appear within a minute because they're hanging out in that first six inches of soil, right? So you start to put this on there, they're like, ah, it hurts and they run to the top and they're super easy to spot. Um, but this is a good way to, to look for them if you're worried um, or if they're on one side of your property, but you don't think they're the other and you're trying to do some management between even zones in your yard, front or backyard kind of situation. So this is all explained on the Great Lake Worms wa Worm Watch website. And so here is it in my yard. And so all different kinds of places in which, and I've never had large worm densities. I've never had more than two jumping worms per square foot. So knock on wood, um, but this is how you do it. And it's relatively easy. Okay, so um, again, there's this continuing research at University of Wisconsin-Madison. The U of M proposal was accepted by MITPIC, so this Minnesota Tr Invasive Terrestrial Plant Pest Center. Um, and then this group, the Minnesota Invasive Species Advisory Council is trying to work with the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, to work on those regulations of yard waste and compost sites. Um, Frankly, we're not making a, head of, a ton of headway there, but we would really like to see uh, clearer regulations on that. So uh, the DNR has asked me to add these two slides. So there is a hope that the DNR will list this as a prohibited invasive species. That is a regulatory, a legal process that has to happen. Um, and the DNR has to, they got a little delayed because of COVID and, and it's, I think they're sort of picking it up again. Um, but the DNR, the planning process rule would classify jumping worms as a prohibited invasive species, but the rulemaking process includes a pub opportunity for public input. Um, and so I have committed to reaching out to our master gardeners and others um, through those platforms that care about this in case you wanna offer your public comment. Because jumping worms are found in all of these different types of things, right? Soil, sod, compost, mulch, plants. Um, so any, any rules that impact jumping worms may impact all of these things. And that's a lot of stuff. Uh, and so, you know, gardeners might be impacted directly with their gardens um, or plant sales, and they might be impacted direct, indirectly by how you share information with others. And so again, this hasn't happened yet. The public feedback period isn't open, but be on the lookout when it is if you have strong feelings and want to make sure they're heard. It's, okay, so final closing thing. So there are no research-based management options for worms, including jumping worms, full stop. Um, there are no legal wormicides or vermicides in the state of Minnesota. And so if you were to Google jumping worms, there are many things that come up, but you should be a bit wary, right? So pesticides are regulated at the uh, Environmental Protection Agency and then regulated a second time at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, we have no pesticides that are labeled for worms. Similarly, fertilizers are regulated by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and none of them are regulated for worm management. So um, you know, you can apply pesticides and fertilizers as are appropriate for your site, but they are not supposed to be worm management products. And so Googler be warned. All right, so a few final take home messages. Invasive species are a threat. You can help with prevention, early detection and rapid response and then management. Um, and with that, I think I have time for questions and I will sort of pause and uh, however you guys choose to do that, I think is probably fine. I have a question. Yes. This is Phyllis. Oh, you said you take a quarter cup of dry mustard to a gallon of water and you pour that on a square foot of your yard and in a minute or two, the jumping worms will come to the surface. What are you supposed to do then? You're supposed to pick them up and put them in plastic bags and throw them out. Is that, is that the whole idea there? 
Well, so it's a great question. And so I'm going to stop sharing so I can maybe see you guys. Maybe you can see me. Um, so that is intended to be a survey method. So the answer to your question is yes, pick them up and put them in, put them in a baggie and throw them in the trash can. Um, it is not a management effort though, right? So it is not intended to drench your entire yard in mustard powder and hope you get rid of jumping rooms. Um, but as a survey method, exactly. And so really, if, 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 you, if you're not positive, you have jumping worms, because again, they're kind of hard to identify. Once you see them a couple of times, you'll get it. But um, in the beginning, if you do the first survey, you get a bunch of worms. You want to take those high quality pictures if you think they're jumping worms, and then you want to report those. And then we can confirm them. And we often can do this just with your images. Um, and, and then once you take the pictures, right? So don't chuck them in the trash too quick. Once you take the pictures, then you can put them in the trash. And again, uh, the truth of the matter is I see no reason to save any of these worms. So I wouldn't lose sleep if I inadvertently threw a night crawler into the trash. Um, but that is the recommendation. Good question. Well, I have another question. There's those worms that people grow in containers in their basement. Yep. Are, so they those, are, worms? are those good worms? Yeah, so those are um, red wigglers typically. And so uh, the idea with that is that's that kind of worm composting that happens and it is often in containers, right? So you can do it under your kitchen, on your kitchen counter, under it, in the basement. There's lots of different ways to do that type of vermiculture. The intent for every system I think I've ever seen is that they would be red wigglers, which are a type of worm that is not believed to be able to overwinter in Minnesota. So um, we generally believe them to be a pretty low risk species. So first, you don't, the intent is not to introduce those worms into the environment. The intent is that the worms will work through your uh, kitchen waste and they'll produce that soil. And then um, the, you'll move the soil minus the worms because the, they often work in like a layered tier kind of situation and the worms don't go actually go out with it um, to the yard. And, and then, we we think that they can't survive here anyway. So if there were some stray eggs or some stray worms that made it out into the yard with your compost, they would die come winter. Um, so in that way, it should be pretty safe. The problem is we know that the wrong that the when the worms arrive, if you say buy it online, they may not all be red wigglers, and we know that jumping worms have arrived with other worms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, if you feel comfortable and red wigglers look red for one thing and they're smaller. So they, they are like different worms, but maybe not so many people look closely at worms. Um, and so again, if it's done as intended, then it, it should be fine. Um, buyer be warned though, that you get the product that you're expecting. Uh, would you advise they, buying worm compost? Um, so I have to say at this point, I'm kind of leery of lots of stuff. And so if, so the, the general recommendation is if you're gonna buy, I, I would say any kind of compost, worm or not, um, any kind of mulch uh, and uh, frankly, any kind of soil, you either need to be very confident you're getting a source that is giving you what they'll likely say is weed free. And again, the temperature is the same. So if they're getting it to a temperature that's killing the weeds, they're probably getting it to a temperature Temperature that's killing the 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 worms, then you're okay. Um, if you're getting it from your neighbor, I really think you should think twice. If if there's any reason to suspect that your neighbor might have jumping worms, because my experience is that um, it's just there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, Again, does your neighbor does your neighbor know how to identify worms? Are the worms all red wigglers? You know, those are questions that uh, they may or may not have the answer to. Uh, compost in general, I don't think I have ever successfully gotten my compost pile to the recommended 130 degrees enough to kill stuff. Um, and I think most home composters, I suspect, do not. And so um, then they're just you're open up to weeds and 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 worms and all kinds of stuff. What do you think about using the county compost? Yeah, so again, if it is a compost site, 
then it is fine. It should be fine. So if it is not, if it is a yard waste site, then buyer be warned. Um, and so if you, I will try to pull that up. Um, there's a great website that, that is managed um, by the state that talks about the differences and where they are. And so you can see in your community, which is which. Uh, I don't know if I can find it really quickly and not sound silly, but I'll try. Hmm. So again, if it's a proper municipal compost site, you should be fine. If it's a yard waste site, unless you have some reason to be very <coughs> confident they're getting to that 130 degrees, um, I, I think you should be a little worried. Hmm. And so I did find this, so I'll drop it into the chat. And then you guys will be able to see which sites are near you. So it's in the chat now. It's that PCA waste compost facilitate facility locator. And um, I can, for those who, I can share my screen again real quick. I have it up. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I did share my screen. Yeah, I have it. Okay, so great. So, um, so as you can see, the brown, all of those brown tree dots, those are yard wastes, like the one in Rochester. The green apple core, those are proper composting sites. Take home message in the entire Twin City area, there are only two proper composting sites. Everything else is yard waste. And so again, proper composting sites should reliably get to 130 degrees and be safe, um, that you should be getting clean clean compost. The yard waste sites, it, it is not so clear. You said that um, like when you buy <clears throat> bags of mulch from Home Depot, it could have them in. What about bags of soil? Yeah, um, same thing. Yep. So again, I think though, so the soil industry um, has long been incentivized not to provide you with weedy soil, right? So gardeners that buy potting soil and grow a bunch of weeds do not rebuy that product, right? Um, so, and, I, and I'm not frankly 100% sure what they do to that soil to get it weed free, but we're fairly certain. I think it's mostly temperature. I've been trying to noodle around and ask people that are more knowledgeable in this area than I, but whatever they do to kill the weeds, we're fairly certain it kills the worms. So if you buy, you know, um, branded reputable soil then in a bag it should be fine um if you're getting it from your neighbor's compost or the yard waste site then that's where you really need to worry and again i think their advertise and i actually spent some time one day in the hardware section soil department looking for even the advertisement of weed free and didn't really see it but the assumption is i think that that they don't it's not good for them to sell you weedy soil right so i think it's all pretty clean is there anything you can do to raise the temperature of your compost? I have a three bin system. If I put fresh cow manure or rotted cow manure in there, would that raise the temperature in those bins? Yeah, so I don't think I can adequately answer this there. Um, I know the University of Minnesota Extension website has composting insight and there are definitely ways you can work to get that temperature out. I am not a composting expert, so I'm going to pitch that elsewhere. Um, and but I will say in our jumping worm management project last year, I think it was so in the end, only 10 people gave me usable information and um, another 15 just found out they had worms too late. Join my product project. And I think they'll talk. They'll they'll put in information in 2021. But those 10 people actually gave me really great data and three of them landed on solarization. The idea that you use heat, sun heat to trap in and kill those worms. Um, and so they did it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but a kind of like this, you know, if you get your temperature, your, your compost to 130, then you can kill the worms. So, so a couple of people tried to get their raised beds above 130 and seemed to be successful. So they were able to get those raised beds um, high enough to kill the worms. Uh, another one dug out essentially a, a, a level bed, but then completely um, 
sectioned it off from the adjacent soil, killed everything in there with solarization, and then had a worm-free space. Several different, uh, a couple of people just used plastic tarping over an area that they were going to plant, heated it, killed all the worms. Now you can still get worm reintroduction, right? So for some of these, we, we're beginning to wonder now if you if you do these things in early spring, so that you don't have any um, first flush of worms. And you can get your your seeds established, right? And you can get your roots growing that you might be able to essentially minimize the impact of jumping worms come later in the season when you actually have more hungry adults. So solarization is a thing that people are experimenting with. And they, so by and large, everyone had good luck with solarization. Um, I, again, it, this does not work at a landscape scale. Right, but at a yard and garden sale, solarization might be a good approach. How many states is the worm found in? So I'll go to states first. Uh, you know, um, the data isn't very good. I think the most reports when I looked at the data yet today was here in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, we know that they're in the southern United States. So it turns out that uh, Minnesota is probably the most aggressive with our invasive species reporting in those tools that I mentioned. So we tend to have very good data. Wisconsin also got some pretty big infestations. So uh, jumping worms got into the Madison, Wisconsin municipal compost site and spread throughout all of Madison really quickly within a couple of years. And I, I frankly, I think that's what happened in Rochester as well, but it's not as well documented. So they have um, decent data on their jumping worms. Uh, lots of other states are not tracking this well. So I know in my project, I had participants in Illinois and Indiana, neither state seemed to know they had them and yet clearly they do. So it's not a great answer, sorry, but I suspect they are more prevalent than they are reported. I'm, trying to, I'm sorry, Karen. I'm trying to find the two actual true compost sites. When I looked up the PCA address that you gave us, it showed all of the yard waste sites that we use in St. Paul. Um, I'm wondering how did you find out which those only two were in the metro area? Yeah, so that same link here, I'll reshare. Um... Thank you. There we go. Yep, no worries. So, uh, um, so here, this one appears to be in Shakopee, Mystic Lake. <laughs> and this is SMSC Organics Recycling Facility. So I'm not positive that that's municipal, right? That SMSC Organics might be a business. That's if anyone- the Native American site. Thank you. I'm like, so maybe somebody knows, I don't know. And then this is the other one, Empire MSW Processing and SSOM Composting Facility. This is in Rosemont on Blaine Avenue. Oh, here, they have a website. Um, and so, I mean, as a consumer, I, I am a strong believer that you need to speak for yourself. You need to advocate for good products. And uh, having experienced this many times, you might get blank looks and crazy lady looks, right? But it turns out you're the one left quite literally holding the can of worms at the end of the day, right? And so, you know, if you are buying product from someone who just thinks you're off your rocker, maybe you don't wanna buy product from them. Um, and, and I mean, I have jumping worms, so I have like a lot of anxiety when people come, you know, we had uh, new internet installed in our yard and they had to bury the line. And I was like, you gotta clean your equipment, right? I've got jumping worms and your next owner doesn't want them. Um, <laughs> Right. And I would like to think they're looking out for me, but I don't, I don't really think they are. I'll just give a tiny shout out to the, um, the Empire site that she just pulled up. Um, they also donate heavily to Eagle Scout projects, just FYI. Um, they donated to my son's Eagle Scout project. They've been known to donate a lot to projects around the area. So it's also called the mulch store. I just, just, I was, I thought that was them. I just double checked by pulling them up and it, that is them. So good spot to go. Angela, you, you didn't uh, also seem to be much of a fan of uh, the regular earthworms, 
I've always been under the impression that I've got, if I've got a lot of earthworms in my soil, I'm uh, doing pretty well, uh, particularly with aeration and everything. What are, what's your feeling there? Yeah, so I was wondering if someone would call me on that, right? So, um, so yeah, so lots of gardeners have a positive feelings about earthworms. And so I think the really important thing is to think about the state of the environment in which you're trying to work in, right? So um, in most urban gardens, you're working in functionally very compacted and abused soil. I mean, it's often been... Um, it's often been leveled and houses have been built on it. I mean, it's just been really compacted and, and frankly kind of abused. Um, and if you con contrast that with forest soils, which tend to have very little human impact on them, um, even a logging job really does very little damage to most soils. Um, and they're so infrequent that the damage is spread out over decades. Um, that Those are not compacted. They, they, without earthworms, there's this really rich humus or, or top layer of leaves and soil that kind of mix together. Uh, and earthworms get rid of all of that and very significantly change the horizons in a forest versus in a yard. But in a yard, if compaction is a problem for you, and it commonly is, then yes, worms do aerate that urban yard. Um, and so lots of, lots of gardeners, um, believe that that worms are useful for their garden and that may be true they have never been useful for our forests in minnesota and so i think the place matters uh and and truthfully there are very few forests in minnesota that don't have worms at this point and so it's just a problem for us um and one that doesn't have a solution right now but in yards they are decidedly less problematic except for jumping worms good question um question yep. question um ramsey county i believe sells its yard waste to these composters they truck it out and and bring it up the temperature and bring it back what's brought back i believe has been sterilized um Ramsey County Public Health would have the absolute question on this because that's who deals with it. Yeah, and so this I think it's fair to ask that of them. So I will tell you, I, I mean, Olmstead County has worked really hard to manage their jumping worms and try to get their soil temperatures high enough to not to, to, to offer clean product, right? And so if, and I would, you said, uh, I think Ramsey County. So Ramsey County is big enough. I don't think this is maybe a new issue for them. So they may be working really hard to manage that. And, and if so, I think it's absolutely your right to inquire about that and see what their answer is. Cause it could be quite good. I mean, you could leave with a high degree of confidence that you're getting a good product. Um, and so, you know, again, I want to give kudos. Olmsted County is not required to, by MCA, M, um, MPCA rules, to, to really do a lot, but they have done a lot. They have moved their whole compost piles. They've done a lot more turning of the compost to ensure those, uh, those higher temperatures. I mean, so they've really done a lot of due diligence. Um, so thank you for that. I, I think it's worth asking for sure. So Angie, could you just repeat those sites that you really liked again? I know you said edmaps.org was a great one, right? Yeah. And the first one was um, gledn or g-l-e-d-n.org. Is that correct? Yeah. So you know what? I'll save you having to take notes. So okay. <laughs> I'm going to drop them in. So um, yeah. So they're in your chat. So these are all of the sites or these are good resources. And so um, that it's, it's in your app store, but it's the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. And so in some it's under G-L-E-D-N, I think in Apple and in Android, it's under both that or the spelled out name. Um, but they're all in the chat now, all those resources. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. So Angie, where you have jumping worms, um, can you grow things? Like, yeah. 
It's a great question. So for reasons that are not clear to me or anyone else, I've never had high volumes of jumping worms, but I've had them for a long time now. So I think the first jumping worms that I found were in 2016, October. And, and full disclosure, I had just left the Upper Midwest, Inva Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference where I spent an entire half day session on just jumping worms, right? So, um, and then I took the Friday of that week off of a half I've been worked very hard um, organizing that conference and was putting my guard into bed and sure enough found those jumping worms and was pretty confident in what I had found. Uh, but just a couple, right? I've never, knock on wood, um, found that, that coffee ground type soil. And so in my vegetable garden was where I first found it, which is where I had put compost year over year from the compost facility or the waste, uh, yard waste facility. And and what I will say is after that, I started reflecting on the volume of wood chips I had been putting down year over year. So it just felt like we were always adding more mulch. Always, always. Like, why are we going through so much mulch? It seemed like this extraordinary amount of mulch. And, and then I got to reflecting, well, are the worms just eating it? Right? Am I just feeding worms with my mulch? And I kind of think I might have been. And so then that like clicked into place, like maybe that's really what's going on. So I will tell you, I went through the stages of grief that I think are common when gardeners first discover they have worms and I really just didn't know what to do about it. So I continued to put in my vegetable garden. I continued to manage my edging landscape and I have an inherited landscape yard. Um, and so, uh, and I didn't notice a ton of difference, but I stopped putting down wood chips. I was like, I don't want to feed the worms. So I got to figure out what I'm going to do. And it took me about two years to figure out what I was going to do. And so in that two years, I tried different things. I never had gigantic volumes. Um, initially, I had jumping worms only in the backyard, which is the downhill side of my property. Um, two years later, I had worms in the front yard. So whether I had unintentionally moved them or they had just worked their way to the front yard, I will never know. But now, now I'm going to do some surveys. So it has been believed that jumping worms cannot live in your turf, that the turf grass might get too hot for jumping worms. Um, I, we're going to test that theory because I have not found anything but jumping worms in my property for the last two years. Now, I will admit I'm not typically looking for them in the grass because I don't really care that much. Um, so we're going to actually look more closely at that. So my grass grows, but it looks like it looks bad. I got a lot of creeping Charlie and a couple of soccer players. So just looks bad. Um, and then the yard edging I care more about and my vegetable garden I care more about. And so I have things growing in there. I still have lots of hostas. Um, they have not killed my hostas yet. And again, I don't entirely know why my, my numbers are lower. So this year, this last 2020, I did put down wood chips and sure enough, my number of jumping worms in that area skyrocketed. So I'm clearly feeding the worms. Um, in my vegetable garden, I solarized uh, it. So I put it under plastic and that seemed to work. So I think I would have killed any um, eggs and or worms that were emerging. Then I planted in it. And then for kicks and giggles, I put down cocoa mulch. So um, it honestly, I thought smelling like chocolate would be good and I was running out of ideas uh, because I had for years been putting down craft paper. So like kind of the paper bag kind of paper to, and then I would plant um, through the paper and that would be my weed control. But I think the worms were eating it. So by the end of the, the growing season, I would have no craft paper left. It would all be gone. Um, so the cocoa mulch seemed to work. By the end of August, when I surveyed, I had no worms jumping, I had no worms in my garden at all. Hmm. So, and now again, I never had more than two in that square foot. So my numbers have always been low. Um, similarly, I wanted to transition one uh, edging bed to spirea, which I didn't really care for, to uh, native pollinator plants. And so I ripped up the spirea, I solarized it with under plastic clear tarp, and then I planted those, um, those pollinator, native pollinator seeds, and they grew very vigorously. And then when I tested that space in August, again, I had no worms. And so, um, and the, the plants were doing wonderfully. They, they really did very well. Um, where I added the mulch in the front yard, lots and lots of worms, because I think I was feeding them. Now, I mean, at some point I have to figure out how to cover my soil, right? I mean, mulch is a useful thing 
to retain water and nutrients and all of those things, right? So <laughs> I'm still sorting all of that out. Um, for what it's worth, my neighbor, same property line is where I put wood mulch and my wood mulch was clean. So I had wanted to try its chip drop, which is a brand new service in Rochester where they put um, the trees, urban trees go right. Uh, so they get cut down, they get put immediately into the chipper and then they get blown into the back of the chip van. And this chip drop service would allow them to dump the whole chip van in my driveway for free but I had no control over when they would come and they just dump it. Right. Um, so there's a huge risk there, but I thought this would be great because it won't have been on the ground. Right. And there are no worms in the living trees. So they just go right into the chipper, right to my house. Um, and so I, I'm about 99% confident the wood came in clean, but then it was full of worms by October. Um, now immediately adjacent to that same space, um, is my neighbor has the rubber mulch. So like the recycled rubber mulch, she had, we couldn't find any worms. I, now I will admit I'd run out of mustard powder and could no longer do a proper survey, but I couldn't find any worms. And I suspect that her rubber mulch, one, is not palatable to worms, they can't eat it. And two, I suspect it heats up enough to be dissuasive. But I mean, again, I could have one foot in my wood mulch and one foot in her rubber mulch and we couldn't find any worms on her side. Now, having said all that, I don't actually recommend rubber mulch, but it was an interesting observation. We also use straw a lot, like at the trial garden at the Arboretum. Um, do you know if they like straw? No, but you're the second person in the last week to ask me that question. So I'm going to throw it out to my jumping worm report management folks and see if any of them have tried straw or interested in telling us they, what they say. So it turns out that a lot of organic farmers use straw as well for a bunch of stuff. And so as they think about sort of really complicated pest management, that question has come up. I do not know the answer, um, but I hope to find out. And I suspect it's not dissuasive, like that they will do just fine. Whether they actually eat it or not, I kind of suspect it's like leaves. It keeps the temperatures down so they're more hospitable. It keeps the moisture level up so it's more hospitable. They may or may not eat it, but they don't die, right? So, but we don't know that, that's a hypothesis. Hmm. I think we're, I think we're okay. Anybody else have any questions for Angie? I do. Okay. Angie? Angie? Yes. The, uh, I believe the U on, uh, has suggested that we don't get hot enough for solar uh, sterilization. That this, you know, in the fall, when, when you go to build that envelope, that we're, we're the sun's in the right angle to get hot enough. Is that right or am I wrong? Do we get hot enough to get that sterilization? Yeah, so I don't know about the fall, um, but I do think that it is pretty promising in the spring. And so it turns out 130 degrees isn't actually all that hot, if you can imagine a tarp and on a sunny day. Um, the, the question is how far down do you get deep enough, right? Um, so yes. We do not get down two feet, right? But we don't need to get down right. two feet for jumping worms. We need to get down six inches. And so can we get down to six inches? Maybe. So, um, and I don't know. So the project that was funded um, that was intended to start last year is using soil probes to look at this, this but they didn't, they were not able to get started because of COVID restrictions and during 2020. So they will start in 2021 and they have very high quality digital thermometers that they're gonna put in the soil to really sort this out. Uh, my project, we did not have any fancy equipment and we just had people reporting and people reported that their temperatures got high enough that they think it was impactful, right? Um, and so we did not have soil probes. We don't know how deep it went, but we observed that there were none or fewer worms afterward than before. I, so I, I, must, I must correct myself. The, the thing I was looking at at the time was to sterilize for seeds, which is not a worm. <laughs> so right. they might be correct with seeds and the, the six inches like you say, 
right and then i think the fall well is different than this yeah the spring too because the sun Thank is at you. a higher point in the spring so good question okay well i think yep. if that's everything um we will let you go angie thank you so much this was very informative um yeah thank you angie yeah you're welcome good luck everybody i know with all this Thanks, nice spring angie. weather the gardening bug has been out right so thank you <laughs> bye bye thanks thank Don't you go on your grass <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. That was very nice.